From Olympic City and the home of Pikes Peak, this is the Automotive ADHD Show. Oh yeah, here we are, rocking it for another great edition of the Automotive ADHD Show. My name is Matt West, a car guy, gearhead, and uh, allegedly the host of this show. Of course, i got a lot of great things to talk about on this show. It is a packed show. i got a ton of stuff to cram into here. Uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is I'm going to have a special guest in the third half of the show. He is a filmmaker making a documentary on Lost abandoned racetracks this is really cool his name is connor hudson and i'm really excited to have him in the uh, third segment of the show and then also got some other great things to uh, talk about uh namely a man in kansas won against the legislator in kansas and prevented them from crushing his classic Corvette uh, and uh, from, from a really silly law. A really silly law uh, led to them seizing the car and threatening to crush it. Well, he won, and this is exciting. Also, really exciting news from Toyota, the newest GR sports car. Toyota back at it again, being one of my favorite manufacturers, and uh, and they're making sports cars. More of them. When everyone's pulling back, they're making more. This is exciting. I got that and a bunch of other stuff to talk about. And the winner of this month's Car Sound giveaway. That's going to be in the second segment of the show. I normally do that in the third, but I'm trying to make some extra room for my guests. So you got to stick around and listen for that. Now, ladies, gentlemen, Pantera di Tommaso's. Yeah, those are cool. Uh, so Friday was April Fool's Day, and among other things, it was the 52nd birthday of the AMC Gremlin. Ha! Okay, I see, I laugh. That was a laugh out of support and cherishing love for the Gremlin. But, uh, no, really, this is interesting. The uh, April 1st, 1970, American Motors Corporation announced the AMC Gremlin, and uh, what a... What a spectacular car for its uh, for its time! Yeah, can you can you can you tell the sarcasm? Is that imparting its way over radio? Uh, it, honestly, I do like the Gremlin, uh, and uh, if uh, you're not familiar, the Gremlin is the weird sort of half car that's got the back chopped off and at a weird 45 degree angle super strange um i do own the amc gremlins bigger brother you see i am a self-proclaimed amc fan and i own a uh, 77 amc hornet which is just a long gremlin or a gremlin is just a short hornet no one really knows what came first the chicken of the egg tomato tomato gremlin hornet they're all same difference same difference but uh having said that the uh, amc gremlin uh in my opinion is an interesting car and especially that much more interesting that American Motors who wanted their car to be taken seriously by the big three by consumers because you got to remember American Motors at the time uh, was competing with Chevy gen uh, as in General Motors uh, Chrysler and Ford and um, so they wanted to be taken seriously and then they unveil a joke of a car on April Fool's Day and then April 2nd rolls around well the car's still there they're oh yeah yeah, we're serious. We're actually making that car. <laughs> and uh, perhaps that's the biggest April Fool's joke in itself. Telling every, releasing something on April Fool's Day that is ridiculous. And then the joke is that they're actually making it. So, uh, I don't know. I think the Gremlin is a cool car uh, in that sense. Yeah, maybe a little underpowered. It has a big straight six. Doesn't make a whole lot of power. Uh, that said, any AMC Gremlin you find now, prime candidate, prime candidate for a... Um, V8 swap. I mean, imagine that. Like, imagine a Hemi in a Gremlin. You could say Hemi, Gremmy. I, I know some people, eh, people have done that already, but that's, yeah, that is uh, kind of uh, cool there. So there you go. Happy birthday, 52nd birthday to the AMC Gremlin. Also, fun fact, uh, AMC Gremlin was designed as the urban legend goes, which Apparently, it's a true uh, legend, so not really a legend then. I don't know. Anyway, story goes that it was designed on a air sickness bag by one of the uh, suits at um, AMC, and they were uh, sketching out cars on an air sickness bag. It looks like a car that was drawn on an air sickness bag. It's got it's got some of that uh, that essence to it, and uh, you know what? I love it, so there you go. And uh, Now, speaking of April Fool's jokes, we saw some really interesting ones from... Um, 
automakers uh, and uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, yeah, okay, everyone's a- April Fools. Like everyone is so hyped on April Fools' Day for all these jokes. Like, is anyone ever actually caught off guard by them? I mean, obviously the AMC thing, yeah, but. Um, this is uh, interesting. Uh, Caterham, the uh, British sports car manufacturer, uh, has a couple of them. They have a funny one. They they build lightweight sports cars. They build kit cars. They're kind of these open, really small roadsters. They're very cool, in my opinion. And um, they decided to, uh, for their April Fool's joke, they had a couple of them, release the Caterham. It's K-A-T-E-R-H-A-M. Emphasis on the ham. Caterham snack slices that are crackers and ham you know like the lunchables uh you know portable you know uh, lunch snack things yeah they decided to have cater ham it's cater ham it's can it's ham that's catered and it's in the shape of a caterham seven so that's uh <laughs> you know what yeah hey the problem with a lot of these april fools jokes i'm gonna get into a few more of these is i would actually buy that so is it it's kind of it's kind of rude to do that as an april fools joke when i would i would genuinely pay money for that and they say, oh, sorry, we're not actually doing that. Come on. Come on. Okay. Here's something that, um, another thing that Caterham is doing. Uh, the Caterham sports cars, uh, if you've seen them, you will know the size of them is very small. Again, European, small, lightweight sports car. They are very difficult to climb in and out of. They are famous for that. And they also kind of don't really have doors. And you got to climb over this hump and, and into this tiny seat. And, uh, they're, they're, they're terrible as far as comfort goes, which that's the price you pay for a fun, nimble, lightweight sports car. But anyway, Caterham also decided to sell uh, entry and egress uh, Caterham 7 lubricant that you put on your seats to allow you to slip smoothly into your Caterham 7. And um, it's uh, <laughs> they photoshopped their logo onto a, a, a container of Vaseline and... Uh, yeah, I don't know about that one. But that said, there's some other interesting uh, ones that I've found. Uh, like there's auto manufacturers are just doing a few interesting things. Honda, for instance, has the Honda Pet Copilot front seats. It's a front seat specially designed for your dog. It's got air vents built into the bolsters. It's got a doggy food dispenser and a food bowl and a water bowl, not to mention the fact that the water would spill because you're in a car and you're moving, but you know, whatever. And then it's got a picture of a dog. That would genuinely be useful if you are a dog person, for instance. That would be that would be very useful. See, again, come on, these useful April Fool's jokes, and uh, come on, I don't know. Um, uh, this one, uh, the, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of different things here. Uh, for instance, Alfa Romeo says that they are going, and bear in mind these are all jokes, but they say that they were going to do Alfa Romeo window filters. So you know how you have on your smartphone on social media, you have uh, uh, filters for the photos. You know you can you can change the color of them, make them look prettier, make them look whatever. I don't know. I'm, I'm I don't do the big social media thing. I do have the Automotive ADHD Facebook page. I do do that in terms of social media. Um, But they said using advanced cutting edge electrochromatic glass, they are going to make filters that allow you, no matter where you're driving, to imagine that you are in Rome, you're in Paris, Milano, all these beautiful places uh, and several places in Italy, obviously, with them being a... um, uh, Italian car company, but not just Italy, some other ones too. And uh, this would think of it like the um, in the movie Back to the Future 2, I believe, they had windows that were actually TV screens and it could show you anything, right? Well, this is that, but car version. Obviously, this doesn't exist. That's a little uh, hyped. Though, electrochromatic glass, they did use that phrase. That is a real thing that is happening in uh, luxury cars. It's glass that, when applying electrical current to it, um, can darken or can, it can get uh, tinted. Or it can lose tint. So it's variable tint glass that uh, uses electric current to do it. It is actually really cool, uh, especially if you see it in person. It looks like witchcraft. It looks like magic. But the push of a button, suddenly the window that was perfectly clear goes completely black or tinted. And uh, a lot of luxury cars, Rolls Royces and some upper end BMWs and even Bugattis and stuff are using this stuff as sunroofs. So you can have a sunroof and at the push of a button, the glass just <laughs> smokes over and goes completely um, uh, non-see-through. So, uh, interesting stuff there. And uh, you know what? If you've spotted some better 
car April Fool's jokes, then the Caterham. That's my favorite right now. Um, then uh, you need to let me know what those are on the Automotive ADHD Facebook page. You can also share your car sounds there on the Facebook page as well. And speaking of those car sounds, I have ones that you sent in coming up here. Now, I'm also going to be talking about some other things. Of course, I have my guest joining me in the third half of the show. I'm really excited to welcome on uh, Colin, or uh, excuse me, Connor uh, Hudson, who is a filmmaker and uh, who's doing a documentary about abandoned racetracks this is something near and dear to my heart as well as a grassroots motorsports enthusiast you got to stick around for that that is coming up here right after this did you know there's a rare but serious condition affecting one out of every million most are born with it and despite decades of research doctors struggle to find a cure the truth is thousands of people simply don't know what cars are for those affected, things are grim, but recent developments show promising success. New clinical trials using breakthrough audio technology have shown a 69% improvement in patients with the most severe symptoms. Treatments vary, but one day we may see a cure. More information is available at ThrottleWarrior.com. Yeah, there we go. That is Nikos listening in Sweden and his K24 Honda Accord. And uh, here in the U.S., we would call that model of Accord the Acura TLX uh, specifically. But I mean, you know, hey, you know, Accord, you know, TLX, Honda, Acura, tomato, tomato, same difference. I want to thank Nikos for um, sending that car sound in again, all the way from Sweden. That is incredible. That that is just very cool to me. Now, that said, uh, I do want to also congratulate uh, Nikos, on being the winner of this month's Car Sound Giveaway. Yes, if you listen to the show, uh, you know that I pick from all the car sounds that get sent to me every month. Pick someone at random, and I pull the, the names out of the deep, dark abyss that is the trunk of... Uh, whatever project car it happens to be this this month. It was the AMC, by the way, the Hornet, you know, kind of in in, uh, in tribute to the Gremlin. I pulled it out of the back of my uh, Hornet this month. So, uh, but anyway, Nikos, congratulations. You have won the stylish and practical automotive ADHD keychain. Well, maybe that's a little too much praise for it, but it is cool. It does tell people you have questionable tastes in podcasts and, of course, a $25 gift certificate to your favorite parts store. Now, uh, obviously, I was able to send uh, last month my winner was also not in the united states that was arturus he was living in he's living in lithuania so if i manage to get the package sent to him i think i can manage sweden as well so uh i'll get that sent out nikos i'll reach out to you again over uh messenger here and uh, get that set up now i do have i do want to uh really you know have my guests coming up here i've got him in the third segment of the show filmmaker uh connor hudson is going to be joining me uh, in the last half of the show. But that said, I do have a couple more things to get to uh, here before we get to that interview, which uh, one thing is a complete victory for uh, gearheads, uh, especially those that are in um, Kansas. And so Kansas has a fairly interesting law. And let me preface this by saying that the gentleman in question purchased his, uh, he purchased a 19 59 Corvette. That would be the C1. That would be the quad headlight version of it. Beautiful, beautiful Corvette. Oh my goodness. And uh, so he purchased that and it was being restored at a uh, custom car shop and it was professionally restored. But apparently when they tore the whole thing down, you know, full frame off restoration, they also, in order to paint it, they removed the VIN tag, the vehicle identification tag. So they took that off, painted the body and then stuck that back on. Well, apparently they didn't use the original screws to stick the VIN plate back on. So when um, this gentleman went to register his, uh, when he went to, you know, actually, you know, register and, and, you know, get everything squared away as documentation, have the car inspected as well, um, the state said, hey, you have uh, non original screws holding your VIN tag. Therefore, per Kansas law, we must assume. That it has been stolen. Yeah, and I, I imagine his heart just just dropped at that moment. And 
per Kansas law, they once they assume it's been stolen, they will confiscate the vehicle pe- pending investigation into the uh, alleged theft of it. And bear in mind, this vehicle wasn't stolen. It had the original VIN tag and VIN number was original. It just had been removed and reinstalled in order to, you know, paint the, the bodywork and, you know, and paint the chassis. So, um But they decided to uh, hold the car hostage. This happened in 2016, by the way. And the reason I'm talking about it now is because, uh, and the man's name I should mention is Richard Martinez. He won his legal battle with the state of Kansas. And he is going to be returned, reunited with his car. I think that is uh, good. That is absolutely a win because there was a danger that they were going to just crush this car. Uh, and the way their law was set up, they said, we assume it's, we'll assume it's stolen. And what happens with stolen vehicles? They don't get auctioned off. They don't you know, get sold or parted out. Nope. State says, too bad. We don't care how nice of a car it is, how rare it is. It's probably stolen, so we're going to crush it, which is um, just a terrible way to do things, honestly. So, uh, now, Richard here, he pulled out all of the stops, all of them, went with lawyers and came in full force at the state of Kansas to at least have an injunction placed on the whole proceeding so the car wouldn't get crushed while they determined, you know, what to do and how to how to get around this law. Uh, and uh, so it's been... What, 2016 until now? It's been six years of legal battles and little litigation and all this stuff. Well, he has finally won. That must be a tremendously relieving thing. And uh, he's going to be uh, re- reunited with that Corvette. Now, what he did say, by the way, now, there is is some damage to the Corvette now being in and out of police impound yards over the past few years. And so it needs a little bit of work. Apparently, he spent $30,000 battling this. He bought the car for about 50000 So he spent a little over half the price of the car just to get it back. But you know what? I commend him. He was he was uh, determined. He was not going to be told off by a silly law on the books. Now, I understand why those laws exist, but here's another part of the victory, though. Uh, the Kansas legislator has decided that they are also going to take a second look at their laws and actually amend it when it comes to certain classic cars in certain instances. So that said, this wasn't just a case of a man had his car confiscated and spent a whole lot of money battling the big government, battling the man, you know, uh, and then got his car back. No, this actually is going to create some permanent change to prevent this sort of thing from happening. So it's a victory in both senses. And uh, Richard says that he is, quote, throwing a party. He says, I'm having a good time. I want to give friends rides around the block. <laughs> There you go. That is super cool. Again, a very cool victory, both in the sense that he has his car and that this is going to permanently change some uh, dubious laws that exist. And I am I'm all for uh, that in favor of, uh, you know, protecting some of these classic cars and saving them from being scrapped and crushed. And I mean, if you know the 59 Corvette, oh, it's it would be a shame. It would be a crime against humanity to crush that car. And uh, so Richard saved it, and uh, now he gets to drive it. Lucky guy. (laughs) So there you go. I thought that was a really cool story there. Now, another thing I want to hit on, we're going to be getting into the guest here in about five minutes, okay? So I don't want to keep the guest waiting too long, but one piece of news that I uh, definitely want to talk about, probably the biggest piece of automotive news this week, is the new GR Corolla. Yes. Uh, Since when were we so excited about a Corolla? Well, I don't know since when a Corolla was this Cool. Toyota uh, was teasing it for a while. They said a new GR sports car is coming. Now, GR is performance or is Toyota's performance brand. You know, think like uh, AMG for Mercedes and you know SRT for for Dodge. It's their that's their kind of performance moniker, and that's where they the, the badge they sell all their performance cars under the uh, GR86. Uh, is, you know, obviously the little, you know, sports coupe. And then obviously the GR Supra, the fifth generation Supra is under that same brand. And now they got an extra one, the GR Corolla. And what's cool about this is it is a very rally inspired Corolla. It's a Corolla hatchback, firstly, uh, and it's a four door hatchback and it's got huge, immensely wide fender flares, a big gaping front end, uh, very clearly very rally inspired to me. I, it looks like a it, it looks like a rally car off of the showroom floor, and I think that's fantastic. And uh, now, importantly, some of the specs on this car: it's got a 1.6 liter. 
three-cylinder turbo, not all that unlike the uh, GR Yaris, which is a car that we don't get in the U.S. because apparently we're not cool enough, according to Toyota and everyone else. So they do give us the GR Corolla, though, and you know what? I'll take that. 300 horsepower, by the way, out of a 1.6 liter three-cylinder. That's 100 horsepower per cylinder. That's incredible. Uh, it's got 273 pound-feet of torque and and all-wheel drive, but importantly, get this, a manual transmission. Oh, yes, it is 2022, and there is another fun car with a manual transmission, all-wheel drive, turbo. Ooh, it's a, it's a good time to be a car fan. I'm just saying. That's a, that's a win right there. And uh, so, yeah, it's got an all-wheel drive system that's really trick, apparently. Uh, it can do... Uh, it's normally in a 50-50 split front to rear. Now, obviously, the Corolla is starts out life as a front-wheel drive, front-engine car. So it's, uh, you know, the immediate thought is, well, it can't be all that good all-wheel drive. It's going to be front-biased. Well, they're saying it's a true 50-50 bias in the all-wheel drive system. And that it can send about 70% of the power to the rear wheels under certain conditions. And apparently it's going to have some sort of drift feature. They probably can't call it drift mode because I believe the uh, Ford Focus ST a few years back, which also, uh, um, or the, the Focus RS, excuse me, the Focus RS, the all-wheel drive one. Uh, from a few years ago, which was discontinued, was again a lot like this, an all-wheel drive, hot hatchback, uh, front bias, but it could send 70% of the power to the rear wheels under certain conditions, though apparently that wasn't very good for it. But hey, what, who, am I to, who am I to judge, judge uh, if your donuts, doing donuts in your car are good for you or, or good for the car or not? So anyway, I'm really excited uh, about this GR Corolla. It means Toyota is going in the right direction. I mean, obviously, the you know CEO of Toyota in Japan you know, he's he, he's a self-proclaimed car guy, and he races and does rally and all this fun stuff on, on, on his weekends. Like, he he is one of us, and unlike a lot of executives at car companies, and this clearly shows with Toyota's reasonably affordable, cool uh, sports offerings. Now, is this car going to come out at a reasonable price? Probably not. Initial, they haven't released the price, but people are speculating probably in the $40,000 range. And then after dealership markups... Oh, gosh, here we are again about that. I've done a whole show on dealership markups, but you could probably expect for the first year these things going off the showroom floor at probably $50,000, which can you imagine spending $50,000? Yeah, I just spent 50 grand on a car. It's a Corolla. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I own two crusty Corollas, too. So who, who am I to talk? Who am I to talk? I'm just excited that Toyota has another fun car that is... It, it's a move in the right direction. What what can I say? What can I say? Now, anyway, I don't want to keep my guest waiting any longer. So on the other side of this break, joining me is filmmaker Connor Hudson. And he's going to be talking about his film uh, that delves into abandoned racetracks and why tracks get abandoned and what some people have done about it. This is really cool. you got to stick around. Every day. Thousands go without the ability to buy necessary and life-saving parts. Parts like turbos, coilovers, and wheels. I'm Steve Turbocharged BRZ. It doesn't run because I can play with my connecting rod through the hole in my block. Project cars sit unfinished, waiting for parts, collecting dust. My name is Todd, and I bought a rotary. It's okay, bro. We'll uh, swap it. But no more. You, yes you, can make a difference. For as little as $5 per month, you can put an end to Project Car's suffering and support your favorite podcast. Patreon.com slash Throttle Warrior. Donate now and receive special perks. Sponsored by Autoholics Anonymous and the Speed Council. There we go. That is, we're, we're strong with Hondas today. That is another Honda Accord. This time, that belongs to listener Eric, and it's a V6 with a, get this, six-speed manual. When was the last time you ran into a six-speed manual? 
Honda Accord. Yeah, just just saying. You know, you don't run into those too often. And uh, now, of course, he's got a big plan as well to uh, do a uh, J35 swap into it, and as well as some other really good performance stuff. So there you go. Best of luck with that, and thank you for sending that into the show. Of course, if you would like to send your car sounds in, you can do that and be entered for a chance to win the Automotive ADHD keychain, as well as that $25 gift certificate. And of course, now I know Nikos won this month, but Eric, as well as everyone else who sent in car sounds um you are still entered for the running in the next month i don't i don't drop those entries out so if you if you have sent in a car sound and you're still there you're good to go and you have a chance to win next month so that goes for you jamie new long colin uh eric and everybody else there you go you got to keep listening stick around for that now i don't want to keep my guest waiting any longer so joining me on the show right now is a filmmaker. He is the owner of Ellie Productions and the creator of Backtracking, the ode to America's racetracks. His name is Connor Hudson. Connor, thanks for joining me on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I, I suppose I should share the story of how we met. It was about a month ago. I was at a track event at Pikes Peak International Raceway, uh, and, uh, you know, it's common to see people with cameras and stuff at track events, but as someone myself whose background is in broadcasting, uh, you, you and your crew stood out a little bit to me. You had some more serious equipment than folks usually bring to the track, and I, I just had to ask you guys what you were doing. So uh, you're working on a film about essentially abandon old racetracks is that correct yep exactly um originally the idea was that we were going to go to a bunch of like actually abandoned racetracks um we had lakeside we had englewood we had colorado springs all those places in mind but one of them was turned into a business park one of them was turned into i think just like land for the u.s military so we definitely weren't allowed there and then another one still stands but we just couldn't get permission to go in there so then our attention turned to Pikes Peak, which obviously is still active, uh, but in a very different way. And then looking at the past of that racetrack, um, at one time they kind of were in the same boat as a lot of those other racetracks where there wasn't anything happening. They were pretty much on the chopping block, going to be just left behind. Thankfully, some new ownership took over. And so we have events like the one we were at on uh, that one day, which was very beautiful, perfect day for filming. Oh, yeah, uh, it was a perfect day for track driving, too. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll throw that out there as well. Um, now, so with, with with you doing this film, I'm sure you've learned a lot about the history of these different things, what's going on with these tracks and how they're saved. And before we get into that stuff, we're going we're gonna to go into all of that. I also want to go into a little bit of, of your background. So let's talk your background as a uh, filmmaker and also as far as cars go. Have you been a car guy? previously or is this just kind of an idea that got you into it i'd like to think that i'm a car guy for sure but my interest has always been more with the actual people who drive them so a nascar fan recently got into f1 and you know if you ask me a whole bunch about different cars and models and uh you know actual things about the cars i probably couldn't say much but when it comes to the drivers the stats the history all that stuff i'm i'm a huge guru that, that's fantastic and uh, yeah there's so much rich history when it comes to racing and you know the racing can't happen obviously without the drivers you know that's uh that's kind of a, a key part there and you know to me i'm a I'm, I'm a i'm a driving enthusiast first and then a car enthusiast second you know the cars are kind of a means to to that end so uh that in that case then let's you know talk about your background in filmmaking as well before the uh before the show here we were you were mentioning that you've been doing this for you know as a hobby for a really long time yeah i I started actually taking things seriously in high school when I joined like a actual YouTube video group and started making videos for the school that they still show. But um, originally it was just like most other people messing around with a camera. When I was a kid, I would try to make stop motions. It was more like me pushing my toy cars in circles, but you know, anything that I could post on YouTube and have fun making. And I've pretty much just been doing that ever since. Wow. Wow. Well, see, and that's where that passion starts with, um, like filmmaking and any anything like that. So that's uh, very cool. So now you're also studying at, I believe you said it was uh, CU Denver. Is that correct? Are you in the film department there? Yeah, I'm studying film and television. And we have a whole bunch of, in addition to having some really great equipment, we have some really great people. I've met a lot of, you know, obviously I had to join amidst the COVID stuff, which was kind of rough. But now that we're off and rolling a little bit, I've got to meet a lot of really cool people. And then also get to do really cool projects like this. 
Wow, very cool, very cool. And uh, so you know, and going going into that, being around like minded people, uh, especially when it when it comes to filmmaking, that is uh, something. Anything that's you know within like the creative arts, there that is very helpful. Uh, do you, do you have any plans on you know uh, taking your career and and we are going to talk your film here in a second. But do you have any plans like afterwards? Just curious uh, about filmmaking, where you want to take this as a, as a career, as something you want to do beyond. Uh, you know, short films, what are, what are some of your plans? Well, I really do enjoy working on just regular short films. I've had a lot of fun with that, but like you said, it's about meeting like-minded people. I've gotten to meet people who are really into film and now with this project and some other stuff, I've gotten to meet tons of people who are really into racing. So, um, if I can find a way to combine those two career paths and maybe get a, a, a career in media and racing of some kind, that would be pretty ideal for me. Wow. See that see that's the dream right there. I'm, okay. Hey, I'm, I'm still working on that one. I'll let you know how <laughs> how that goes. Now, now let's let's delve into your film uh a little bit. So we talked about some of your background uh and uh so your films about abandoned race tracks more. What are some of the tracks that or some of the history, some of the stories, you know, of your film? What have you learned so far in the production of this? Well, I've been trying to keep it to Pike's Peak. The only thing is that Pike's Peak, you know, doesn't really have a history past the 90s, I think, whereas some of these other tracks like Lakeside uh, clear back into like, I'm pretty sure it was created in 1913. So it has a whole century of uh, stories to tell, basically. Um, but even then, you know, there's still tons of other uh, stories of places closing, places that are currently abandoned, places that got turned into other things. I didn't even know that the Englewood Speedway, which is pretty much within walking distance from my house, is uh, a, a business park now. I had no idea. And there's no remnant of that place. So wow. uh, there's just some really interesting stuff to, it, it all has to do with property. And, you know, it's like I say, and one of the, one part of the script, I say, you know, nobody really cares about the local McDonald's closing down because usually another one will just take its place. But this is very different because usually these places there there is no replacement. Like these places are closed down or just kind of left behind. Right, right, and it, and it's tough to you know if a racetrack closes down and is developed over, it's it's a little you're hard pressed to tear down a uh, a shopping mall and say hey we we built this mall but we really want a racetrack here. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you're a little hard pressed to do that, and especially as you know urbanization goes and cities expand outwards into areas that were once rural. Uh, you know you I, I see the challenge too where you might have a racetrack or an old one and you wanna you wanna bring it back, but now it's it's you know in a more developed area and you know there's houses and you know no one's you know wanting that i mean obviously i you know if i could have a racetrack in my backyard i would be all for it but oh same here, same I, here. <laughs> i'm pretty sure the the average folk don't necessarily agree with that sentiment which it's tragic. I think I think we have to convince them of that. But yeah. um, what what have you learned specifically? So we've got Pikes Peak International Raceway here in our own backyard in Colorado. Now I have uh, obviously I, I have listeners listening around the country, around the world. But Pikes Peak International Raceway uh, has some interesting history. Obviously, we have Pikes Peak where the big hill climb happens. You know, I. I talk to people from other countries, and they're like, oh, where are you from? Colorado Springs? Oh, uh, the Pikes Peak. I know Pikes Peak. So they know yep. that. But yep. Pikes Peak International Raceways is a little different. So I, I assume you've gained some insight as well into that in the course of doing this. Yeah, it's that, that was the first thing I talked about. And I remember I was talking to this one person, and he talked to me about all these connections, all these people I could talk to about Pikes Peak. And then I think at the end of the conversation, I was like, yeah, and we're going to be going to the racetrack. And they looked at me, and they were like, racetrack? And we had to solidify that it was the speedway, not the the hill climb course. But um, the speedway itself, and it's interesting you mentioned about you know how we'd, we'd like a speedway in our backyard. Uh, that's actually kind of how Pikes Peak got closed down and got reborn. Was that they uh, the ISC International Speedway Corp? Um, they bought out Pikes Peak, and originally, I, I guess the original plan was that they were going to utilize it. But then they had plans to build another racetrack out near DIA. Then a committee raised up, they kind of rose up against that. And so they had this racetrack that they had no plans of doing anything with and another idea for a racetrack that they couldn't do. So they just kind of left it behind. They sold it in 2008. There was a short return to racing there in like, I think 2012, 2013, 2014. And then after a little bit, it just stopped again. Um, thankfully now, uh, thanks to the ownership, Joe Garoni and all the people who work there, um, they've given it a lot of new life and it's really interesting to see the creative different things they're doing with that place. Right. Right. And as someone myself who, uh, enjoys that racetrack, 
uh, on a weekendly basis. You know, I, I can be found out there a lot. It's it's my home track in that sense. You know, it's interesting, too, seeing how, you know, that track has a history going back, and, and you may be more eloquently versed on this than I am, but it has a history going back into, like, essentially NASCAR uh, and, like, stock car racing and other things. It's a You have a big oval for the track layout. You've got this really huge oval. You've got grandstands, and where we race typically now is in a infield road course built on the inside of the oval. But, you know, it, it goes back to some of that history as well, which I think is fascinating. Oh, yeah. And, like, it used to host Bush series, truck series, like all the NASCAR series. And then the most surprising one to me is IndyCar. It was a hot spot for IndyCar, which you wouldn't think looking at it. When you think IndyCar, you think road courses, you think the giant super speedways like Indianapolis. You don't think a tiny one mile bull ring, but they race there. They race there a lot. Yeah. And that's, you know, man, it would, it would be amazing to hear the sounds of IndyCar going around that track now. That would be <laughs> oh, for in- sure, incredible, incredible. So you uh, you also mentioned that you had you know, you've talked to a lot of people uh, in the course of making this film. Who are some of the guests you've been able to to talk to in this? Well, the biggest one is definitely Joe Garoni, who uh, I met at um, in 2020. They had this event where people who graduated high school could go around in their cars as like a um, you know final saying goodbye type deal and. Um, they had the Furniture Row Racing 78 car out there, which is now the Falsi Adaptive Motorsports car, and Joe Garoni was the one driving it. So I got to meet him then. I got to ride in the car. It was like the, it was the perfect day, basically, for me. Um, but I reached out to him about this film, and then we've gotten to interview him and talk to him about not only his history, because he's worked for Bill Elliott. Um, he's worked, I want to say, PPI. He was one of the people who worked in there. That was like with uh, Ricky Craven. And then he's also worked in NASCAR in their R&D program. So he's had you know, history as a racer, as a mechanic, as a track owner, as a team owner. He's had so much experience in so many different areas. And now he's working as the chief operating officer at Pikes Peak. And like to talk to him about what his vision is for the track. I mean, I expected him to really be focused on his past, but it's kind of amazing. He's all eyes on the future, all eyes on what that place could be and the kind of conglomerate entertainment venue that... Uh, he hopes to see it become. Wow. And, and you know, and it's clear as a just a grassroots enthusiast, a racer myself, you know, that that they do have a very cool vision for that, because, you know, I remember years ago there uh, they had some other management and, you know, they did some events here and there and the events were fun and they were cool. But now they've just I mean, they've stepped up the quantity of grassroots events, you know, 50 bucks, get in and go do, a, you know, a autocross course or this or go do drag racing the day before they do a. um. Uh, eighth mile drag on one section of the oval uh, as well, which is uh, which is kind of cool. So, you know, there's a they also used to do drifting out there a lot. And that's becoming popular there again with the um, uh, slush motorsports festival and lots of things that they have uh, going on. So that's that's fascinating that you've been able to talk to, you know, someone who's behind that now, who's who's that forward thinking. Um, now, the, your film here, it's still in production. When are you planning on on releasing this? I'm really excited to see it. So it should be released in May, and it'll be uploaded to my YouTube channel, Ellie Productions 49. So it should be free to view for everybody. Um, yeah, so we're thinking about May. May, awesome. See, I, I'm, I'm going to be waiting, waiting patiently here. I'm, <laughs> click subscribe. <laughs> Let's go. Let's wait for that to come out. Now, my guest again is uh, filmmaker uh, Connor Hudson. And is there anything else you've run into, perhaps anything challenging over the course of the uh, production of this film? I think the biggest challenge has just been, like, honestly, growing up in Colorado, being a NASCAR fan, it's there's not a lot of NASCAR out here. That's the weirdest thing. So, um, you know, originally, the, the all the challenges came in the beginning when we were planning the film out um, with the Lakeside Speedway being the original uh, place we had in mind. Um, you know, they always say, they're like, if you want to contact somebody, go to their website, go do something like that. And I went to the Lakeside website, and I think they had only two buttons, and it was for applying for a job or for signing up for their newsletter, which I signed up for the newsletter and never got anything, so I guess it's really just one button. But that was really the biggest challenge, was finding a place to go. But then I reached out to Joe at Pikes Peak, and he was so accommodating, and getting to go there and experience not just all the stuff he had to say and all the stuff he showed me around um, to see, but also to go there for uh, the event and talk to a whole bunch of different drivers. And I wish we had gotten more of it on film, to be honest. But um, that's the crazy thing about race car drivers and people who come to those uh, events is that they come from all different backgrounds. Some of them are gearheads. Some of them are just trying their hands at speed. And 
uh, it's just really, really great to talk to all of them and uh, get to meet all those people. Wow. Wow. I am, I am again, absolutely, uh, uh, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm very excited to, to see the film once it's uh, finished. You can uh, find him on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at LA Productions uh, 49. Connor, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show, talking some cars, talking some, some racing, and especially your film. This is going to be fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for having me. There you go. Connor Hudson, my guest. Now, of course, I want to thank you, the listener, as well, for joining me on this edition of the show. And I also want to thank my Patreon subscribers, all the fine folks there, uh, Robert, Renai, James, Harry, everybody else for uh, supporting the show, making the automotive ADHD keychains, making that a possibility. And, of course, in doing so, they are getting early access to the show. So, of course, if you would like to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash throttle warrior now i will see you same time same place next week when i uh race a talking volkswagen and lose i'll see you then